Welcome back to another Biostats video. This time around we'll be talking about bias and types of study errors. So we're going to start with the first one, which is under recruiting participants. It's, it's the only bias here mentioned in FA 2020. It's called selection bias. The problem with selection bias is that you are handpicking people, or maybe you're picking people in such a way that it, it doesn't fit the theme of randomization. You, you are picking people in, in a non-random fashion. When you do this, you are actually not getting the, the representative sample for that population. You're getting a biased sample, therefore you cannot really apply to that population. So one of the ways you can, you can actually fix this is, you guessed it, by randomization. You can also obviously ensure the choice of the right comparison reference group. You can make sure that the, that the sample is representative of the population. Uh, and I feel like that, that goes without saying, but the major thing you need to remember is that it, it you know, doing randomization really helps uh, eliminate this bias. They talk about two examples. One is called the Brixton's bias, one is called the attrition bias. In Brixton's bias, basically, if you take people from a hospital uh, as your sample, well, people in a hospital are generally, you know, they go to the hospital because they're not that healthy. And the general population is generally a lot more healthy than people who go to the hospital. So if your sample is just built on top of people who just go to the hospital, therefore your sample is slightly biased. With attrition bias, what ends up happening is that, is that some participants, they're eventually lost in follow-up. And what this happens is that you end up having a, a, a biased result. One of the ways we can explain this, let's say we have a group of 100 people. And let's say throughout the study, 30 of them ended up not completing the study. So this is 30 people, they did not complete the study. Either they left because they were intolerating the medication, maybe they died from the medication, so on and so forth. And let's say 70, they had perfect, you know, perfect results. They, they all managed to, to alleviate the disease from them using the medication, so on and so forth. Well, if you just take this number, you say, hey, look, 70 people got better. Uh, so clearly the 70 people that all use the medication that are, that are in our study uh, has 100%, you know, success rate. This is wrong. You are, you are removing these 30 people from the original sample. So this is what attrition bias is. It's when you focus on this number when the truth is you should be focusing on, on, on these people as well. So you should take the whole 100 in view. So you take these uh, along with the ride, along with the, with the analysis. Now, what does this mean? Uh, this is actually this actually goes to to a specific uh, concept. It's not a bias, but it's called intention to treat analysis. What intention to treat analysis is? It is when you are analyzing this group based on your intention to treat all of these people here. That's why they call it intention to treat analysis. You are not analyzing only these people. You are analyzing all of these people based on the intention to treat. In fact, intention to treat is so, um, you might find it ridiculous, but this is how it actually works. If you have, for example, one group taking a placebo and one group taking, for example, drug X, if one person from here goes to this group and one person from here goes to that group eventually throughout the study, you actually still analyze them as if this person was taking the placebo even though he's now currently taking drug X. Generally you cannot just say, oh hey, um, we have 70 people who, who pretty much succeeded with the drug so uh, the chance is 70 over 70 of ha having you know good results with the drug so it's 100%. You, can't, you cannot really say this, you have to sort of analyze the whole group. And this is why they mentioned that it, it, is under, it falls under selection bias. But again, uh, FA doesn't really mention intention to treat analysis, but it is important. It does show up on, on questions, and be familiar with it. One more thing that I really want to harp on is try and know the names, because sometimes the names will pop up in the exam. So they'll, they'll give you, for example, a scenario, and, and there's clearly a bias involved. They're, they're clearly describing a scenario where bias is involved. Sometimes they ask you what is the type of bias. You can just say selection if they're describing attrition. Or sometimes they even describe this this whole scenario and tell you what is this bias, and you have to mention attrition. They could have, uh, for example, bricks in there or anything, or for example, Hawthorne effect, and you have to know, hey, it's attrition bias. The next four biases will fall under uh, when you're performing the study. So when you're performing the study, you can form uh, different types of biases. Let's start with the first one called recall bias. The best way to explain recall bias is let's imagine there are there are there's a group of pregnant women, and let's say you know there's many of them in here, and let's say for, just for the sake of, of you know this uh, example, let's say that that it is already you know established that uh, for for some reason Panadol. Panadol can cause, for example, birth defects, okay? So let's say you're just another study trying to also, you know, prove this. Maybe it's re relatively new, so you're doing it in multiple countries. So maybe they all read this. So then, you know, they, let's say, for example, a certain portion of them 
had uh, you know birth defects with with their children, let's say you ask them, hey, were you taking any Panadol? They're more likely to say yes, even if they didn't, just because they know this 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 fact. They know that oh wait, Panadol did cause birth defects. I did read something like that. So yeah, yeah I, I was taking Panadol. This is called recall bias. It is when they subjectively recall things that may have not happened just because they know a fact. And that's why it says here, patients with disease recall exposure after learning of similar cases. The best way to handle this is instead of trying to ask her, hey, in the first trimester, were you taking any Panadol? No, instead try and ask her uh, each semester, or try and ask her, for example, monthly, weekly, so on and so forth. Try and decrease the time from the exposure to follow up. This is obviously going to be common in retrospective studies, and I think the, the, the idea is clear. If you're doing a retrospective study, it is the only way people have to recall information because you're at this point and then they have to go backwards in time and you have to ask them, hey, were you, do were you taking this? Were you doing this? Were you doing this? And then they have to think. They have, in other words, they have to recall. So it's obviously going to be common in retrospective studies. The next one is measurement bias. Measurement bias is when you're systematically uh, gathering information in a very distorted manner. If you if you actually watch the video about precision and accuracy, you know, recall we mentioned an example, a very nice example, where you have a weighing machine, and for some reason someone uh, changed it so that whatever weight you get, you will actually uh, it, it will increase by 10 kilograms. So so for example, if someone got 80, if someone is 80 kilogram, uh, then then uh, you know the the machine would tell you. 90 and this is obviously wrong it's it's not necessarily that that valid so this is this is exactly what measurement bias is it is when you're you're gathering information in a distorted uh, in a systematically distorted manner and their example is also great using a faulty automatic sphygmomanometer so you're you're you know it might give you constantly faulty results they could be reliable or they could even not be reliable but the point is that you're using it in such a way that you're gathering information from each single patient in a wrong manner it's not in a valid manner a common name you might see is Hawthorne effect, and it is a type of measurement bias, but it describes a specific uh, event where people are changing their behavior just because they notice they're being observed. So let's say we have a bunch of participants here, and let's say this is a timeline, okay? Now, maybe at this point, you know, they decided they want to change, right? They're, they're going to change right here. They're going to change and do something different uh, according to the study, according to whatever the study's goal is. So at this point, we've been measuring something. And this, all of this right now, right here, all of this means something. All of this is, is consistent right now with whatever we've been measuring. Then when they change their behavior, then all of this has become inconsistent with this. We're measuring here something different. So, so instead of being consistent all the way throughout, at one point we're just changing things up. It's being inconsistent. And that's why they call it a measurement bias because right now, Information is not being systematically gathered. Instead, it is being systematically distorted. One of the ways you can actually fix this is by using objective, standardized, and previously tested methods. By using an appropriate sphygmomanometer, then you'll be able to be sure that you're not gathering information in a systematically distorted manner. You can also use a placebo group, and the reason this makes sense, I'll show you in a second. With a placebo group, let's say, for example, this group, regardless of whether they're using a faulty or a good sigma manometer, let's say they were using a faulty one. Let's say with a faulty one, they got, for example, measures of 100 over 80 average. Now, when you have a placebo group, the placebo group will have the same mistake. For example, let's say this was the, the good group. Let's call it X. And in the placebo group, let's say, for example, they got 80 over 60. Even if, if this group was supposed to be 120 over 100, and this group was supposed to be 100 over over 80, sorry, 100 over 80, you'll notice that the changes from this group to this group are exactly equal to the changes from this group to this group. So the idea is that when you use a placebo group, the same mistake is being applied. Therefore, the comparison between the groups is still the same. That's why they mentioned using a placebo group is actually beneficial. Now next up we have procedure bias and we have observer expectancy bias. I'm going to explain them both at the same time because they're they're usually uh, you know their biases are, are are mitigated by the same effect. So I'm just, I'm just going to explain them both together. For procedure bias, one group is being treated differently from another. So instead of the drug being the, the reason why they, for example, succeeded in whatever uh, intervention that's, that's being used, instead it might be it might be the different treatment. For example, let's say let's say you treated one group and put them in a specialized hospital, and the other group is, is in a very rural hospital. Maybe it's not it's not the the drug 
drug itself that's causing the better outcomes, but maybe it's because you're treating them a bit differently. You're treating them with, with you know, pampering them in, in a specialized hospital that's giving them the better success rates in, in whatever way you're, you're measuring it. Let's say, for example, mortality rate or, uh, you know, how, how a recovery rate, for example. But the idea is that is that it's not really the drug doing it. Maybe it's it's pampering them inside the, the specialized hospital units that's causing the actual difference. Observer expectancy bias is really when researchers just put their own opinion, their own belief into what the, the study or what they expect the study will actually show. So, for example, if, if an observer is expecting that the treatment group will show signs of, of recovery, he's more likely to document positive outcomes. And this example is perfect. Uh, a person who, who expects, for example, the drug to work will more likely say, hey, look, these are recovering. He'll be more a lot more lenient with documenting these positive outcomes. The way you can mitigate both types of biases is by is by blinding them and using a placebo. Now, using a placebo should, should be obvious to you, but let's talk about blinding for a bit. If you blind them, blinding means that they don't know who is taking the drug. They know that one group is taking one drug and the other group is taking one drug, but they don't know which group is taking which drug. And that is huge because once you once you mitigate that, researchers cannot put their opinion or cannot put what they expect into the study. They have to just do the study because they don't know which person is taking which drug. So they can't treat different groups differently and they can't put their own opinion when they don't know which group is using which drug. So those are all the biases under performing study. Uh, let's move on to the next page. Last but not least, we have confounding bias, lead time bias, and length time bias. They're all under interpreting results, and I think the most important one is confounding bias. I really want to talk a lot about confounding bias because I think it's very important and that there isn't enough harp on it on YouTube on many different sources. When we talk about confounding bias, I'm just going to put it on this corner. So confound, and then let's split the board, and I'm going to put here effects modification EM. I want to make one thing very clear. Confounding, it is bad. Effect modification, it is good. If you find confounding things in your in your study, that is absolutely bad. You want to get rid of them. It's a bias. Effect modification, it is 100% good. It's a good thing that you found it, and it is 100% should be included in the study. Confounding, bad. Effect modification, good. So let's start with confounding. I'm going to put a C up here in the corner so you remember it's always confounding. Um, I'm going to use the example the UWorld uses. It's not the question the UWorld uses, but in the explanation, in the, in the uh, part for that, that gives you the explanation, they use this example, and I love this example because it's really easy to understand. Let's say we plot, for example, IQ on the y-axis and shoe size shoe S on the x-axis. And, um, you know, it's, it should be obvious to you that, hey, if we increase shoe size, all the points will look sort of like this, where the IQ increases. And you'll have some dispersed points out here, sort of like this. But, but overall, the trend is going in this direction. So, so there is a correlation between the two. So then the study would sort of, um, you know, it, it, would, it would dictate that, hey, shoe size, shoe size, as it increases, IQ also increases. Now the problem here is they may have not, um, you know, you know, accounted that there might be any confounding, uh, you know, variables that 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 it's causing this relationship to appear when in fact there there there's no relation. There there's nothing there's nothing close to this relationship. Maybe there's something that's causing this relationship to appear at first glance, but maybe it's not there. So what you can do is you can stratify. You can, you can separate different groups and see does the trend still belong even after we divide them. Or does the trend disappear? If it stays, then that's not a confounding variable. If it disappears, then that is a confounding variable. Here's an example. Let's say we separate uh, based on age. Let's say we take those who are age, for example, 3 years old, and those who are age, for example, 10 years old. So let's say these points right here, they just happen to be the ones with the 3 year old. So if we actually magnify this, I'm going to magnify it down here, it'll give us this graph. And this is, these are all the points for the for the three-year-olds, and their points are going to be scattered. There's no trend. There's absolutely no trend. So you can't say that there's a trend anymore. And and you know the, the y-axis is still IQ, the x-axis is still uh, shoe size, shoe S, and you can see there's no trend. Once we once we gathered all the three-year-olds, there's no trend. And and same goes if we if we grab all the ten-year-olds and we magnify it. Here's the x-axis again. This is IQ. And this is shoe size, SS. And then uh, let's say this was, yeah, 10 year old. And then also the points will be very, very scattered. So again, there's no trend. So if, if at first 
statistical significance, forget this, this is, this is shoe size, this is not statistical significance, if, if statistical significance at the beginning was was true, you know, it, it was there, it was significant, uh, if there was statistical significance in the beginning, but then after you stratify, statistical significance is gone, then this is this is basically your, your summary of, of, of confounding bias. Notice how when we stratify based on based on a specific variable, uh, the, the trend just disappears, the, the, there's no trend, there is absolutely no trend. Uh, this means that this relation to the you you saw it first is is probably because age was was playing a factor in, in, into this and and it's not really this relationship that that existed uh, it's, it's not really based on your shoe size so much as it is that if you if you're smarter you know a 10 year old is def definitely going to have uh, uh, you know more IQ than someone who's three years old so it's probably age playing the factor not really shoe size if you contrast this with with effect modification it becomes very clear. Uh, I love using the, the example of, of Rye syndrome in, in children. So let's say, for example, we have this distribution and the x-axis is liver function tests, okay, the liver function enzymes, after, for example, giving um, all the participants aspirin. Now, now, the majority of the participants, let's say they were adults, so the majority of the values will lie in here and, and eventually there might be some values interspersed and eventually the average will be very similar, it could be any one of these lines, very similar to the to the mean, the mean of the population. However, when you stratify, let's say for example we took children and adults. All the children, I'm just going to highlight this in a smaller, smaller graph, all the children might be just in this little corner. Maybe all the children are here and all the adults, all the adults were actually here. So notice, because maybe the adults were, make up a large portion of the study, maybe all of them pulled the average all the way to the middle. But if you stratify them, you can notice that, hey, children, children alone do make statistical significance. So maybe in the beginning, statistical significance is not present. But then after you stratify, you notice that maybe one or the other, or possibly even both, there is statistical significance. In this case, this one has a significance, but this one doesn't. Uh, but, but the general idea goes that with effect modification, before you stratify, there's no statistical significance. And then after you stratify, you notice something, something clever. That, that in children, for example, in, in this case, children who are given aspirin, their liver, their, their liver function does, they say skyrocket. And why are they skyrocket? Because we know that they, there's this little syndrome called Rye syndrome. Another talk for another day. The idea is that the, the the only way you can pretty much find this is if you if you, you know and you understand that how that effect modification is not really a bias, but it's something that can be countered with confounding. Confounding, you start with it giving the, the notion that there is an actual relationship, there is statistical significance, but then after you stratify, you notice that there is no statistical significance. And that, that is the beauty of confounding versus effect modification. Again, this is all that we talked about on the whiteboard, so I'm not really going to go over it. And the way, they, the way they reduce the bias is by doing multiple repeated studies. That's one way you can solve it. Crossover studies because you get subjects acting as their own controls. And then matching. Matching basically means that patients with similar characteristics go into both the treatment and control groups. It's, it's similar to basically crossover studies, but instead of actually doing the crossover process, if you don't know what a crossover study, you can always go to the study designs video that I made. Uh, I'll actually link it in the description if you'd like to go see it. But, but matching serves the same purpose as crossover studies. The only difference is instead of using every person as their own control, you're just matching them by getting similar characteristics. For example, if someone's a smoker, you're going to try and make two smokers, one in the treatment group, one in the control group. Last but not least, we have lead time bias and length time bias, and they could not be any simpler. Lead time bias is when you think that you're increasing survival by detecting the disease early on. For example, let's say this is a timeline, and most people, for example, that get uh, pancreatic cancer, it's a deadly disease, but let's say they get pancreatic cancer, they die within a year. Okay, they die within a year. Now, let's say you diagnose it um, here, and you have six months left. Just because you diagnose it three months earlier does not mean that you, that you changed any of the outcome. Now, I don't know how long pancreatic cancer actually does take to, to, to become symptomatic and, and cause death, but let's say, for example, it initially starts here, no one detected it, and then it takes a year until it finally kills someone. Maybe our best detection methods detected it when it's six months out. When it's six months out, then we detect it and tell them, hey, you have six months to live. If we detected three months earlier, but they just have nine months to live, we didn't increase survival time just because it goes from six months 
to nine months doesn't mean we increase survival time. They still die at this point. They still die at this point. Therefore, early detection does not mean increase in survival time. This is very, very important. One way you can just reduce this is by measuring back end. So you, you, so you start from here and go backwards. And you, if you notice this relationship where, hey, we didn't actually change the time of death, we just, you know, we just detected it early. That's how you, that's how you mitigate back end analysis. So measure back end survival and adjust survival according to the severity of the disease and time of the diagnosis. What they mean by that, for example, is, is that here it might be very severe and here it might not be that, as severe. So, so the idea is that if, if that's the case, then it's more likely that, you know, you're just detecting the disease early. You're not really increasing survival time. Last but not least, we have length time bias. Now, length time bias is a very, very easy one to understand. The best way to explain it is with the whiteboard. Let's say we have a disease. We have two diseases that we're comparing on this on this x-axis. We're only interested from this period of time to this period of time. Okay. Now um, let's say this was, for example, 18, 2018. This was 2019. Uh, let's imagine we have two diseases we're comparing. Let's say one is here uh, going to be, um, let's say, pancreatic cancer or any type of cancer, pancreatic cancer. And let's say here we have the common cold. Common cold. Now, the pancreatic cancer, it might be generally very long. We might have different cases. These, all these dots are different cases, and, and these lines that are extending from there are, are how long they're getting, how long they're, they're, they're keeping uh, pancreatic cancer. I say keeping, but you, you know the point I'm trying to get across. Uh, and let's say we have all of these different cases, and they're all, you know, sort of somewhere back here, and they're driving inwards. Now, common cold is very short. It might just be like that, like that, like that. I know common cold is much, it's much, uh, you know, more common. So there should be, like, I should be littering the whole place with dots. But just to get the point across, what I'm trying to do is compare a disease with with a very long length. Uh, for example, it it stays with you for a very long time, and sort of a disease that doesn't really stay as long. A disease that has a very short short time interval. So if you have, for example, let's say many of these, one stays for very long. Let's say one stays like that, one like that, and one like that, and one like that. If you do a screening test at any point, at any point, you are more likely to grab more of the chronic disease than you are to get the acute diseases. This is very important. Just because you caught more of the chronic diseases does not mean that there are more chronic diseases. It doesn't mean that these outnumber the acute diseases. It's because they're so short you couldn't detect them. Screening screening tests don't detect them as much. Notice I, the dots are almost equal on both sides. I can even, you know, mitigate that by making more here. Notice how the common cold is way more common than pancreatic cancer. But it's because you can't really you can't really screen you can't really screen as well because they're all so short. You're not going to grab a million in one day. But for pancreatic cancer, maybe if there's, for example, you know, as, as many cases as, as it takes, you might grab them all, for example, in one day because of how long they stay with the person. So again, screening test detects diseases with long latency periods while those with short latency periods become symptomatic earlier. And then they use the example here of a progressive cancer versus a rapidly progressive cancer. Same idea, just this is pancreatic cancer, this is uh, the common cold. And the idea generally is that just because one is, is, is found to be more common than the other doesn't mean necessarily that it is more common. Maybe you're just catching it more because it's more chronic or it's more progressive than the other one, which develops a lot more rapidly. The best way to, to handle it is with a randomized controlled trial, assigning subjects to screening program and to original screening program. Again, your, your randomized controlled trial will really help you here. And hopefully with that, I hope you nail every single question about biases. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Consider liking and subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching. And their example is also great using a faulty automatic sphinx... Sphinx... Sphigmo... Manometer. Sphigmo... Manometer. Sphigmo... Sphigmo... Manometer.